Law is not law if it violates the principles of eternal justice. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Our topic of discussion today is the online safety bill is freedom under threat. You can join in as far as the conversation is concerned. You can send in your messages via WhatsApp. The number is not 76 656 5353. The number once again, not 76 656 5353. To post questions from our panelists tonight, onto my immediate right is Dinesh Tambi, consultant English news director at News First, as well as journalist Sandro joining me this evening. Uh, to post questions from the panelists. Uh, let me quickly introduce our panelists this evening. Joining us this evening on the show are Professor Rohan Samarjeev, Asela Vaidyalankara, cyber security expert, Ambika Satkaranadhan, former commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, as well as Dr. Rohan Tatakorala, country head, Clue Track Software Labs, Sri Lanka Maldives, and Pakistan. Let's get the ball rolling with Professor Rohan Samarjeev. Chair Learn Asia, what are your thoughts on the online safety bill? Do you think that freedom is under threat? Well, I think this bill should be withdrawn. That's where I would begin. Uh, I don't think it does solve the problems that exist. Uh, I don't think it is consistent with our constitution and will therefore, if it does go up for constitutional review, I believe it will have to be changed uh, significantly. And uh, because it takes over for the executive functions that should belong to the judiciary. And usually our judges are quite jealous about this. Even if you are looking at it as a purely administrative act by people in the executive, it violates the principles of natural justice. And therefore, uh, I think it's wrong on these three levels and it should be withdrawn. And instead, I think we have a solution that will address the key problems, which is an industry code that will address most of the issues that we are thinking about. And if they want, for example, there's the question of there's some provisions on revenge porn, uh, for which uh, people have been talking about for several years, uh, three, four years. Uh, those kinds of things I think we can do with, a, with an amendment to the penal code. Uh, there's, there's really no reason why that should be combined with this. There are some provisions regarding uh, contempt of court. Of course, we have a need for a systematic approach to contempt of court. There's no reason to have a special provision on online contempt of court, when in fact what you should do is there has a private member's motion, there's a government motion which is problematic on contempt of court. They should deal with that separately. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a flawed uh, uh, piece of uh, legislation and uh, it's unfortunate that it was not put up for uh, consultation by people who, who know the subject, who, are look who look at the specificities of uh, online communication. So I can recall when I was uh, asked about this, uh, this was four years ago in 2019 in the aftermath of the uh, Easter bombings uh, about uh, online content that could cause harm, I uh, gave them advice on what could be done about this and I offered to bring uh, people from the online platform companies uh, for a public hearing with the, with the uh, Parliamentary uh, Oversight Committee on National Security. Unfortunately, that offer was not taken up, that didn't happen. So the problems can be addressed, but there's no reason to think that this is a solution to the problems that we have. This will cause more harm and I can go on about what kinds of harm it will be caused because of the vagueness of the language. There will be a situation where either the content creators or the platforms will be kind of over rigorous or too strict in their uh, self uh, policing or self regulation, which will be quite harmful for expression. So there perhaps I, I agree with your with the tenor of your question. Uh, Professor, this is the second time in a few months that the government has brought a bill haphazardly. If you look at the anti-terrorism bill that was brought in, it was withdrawn by the Minister of Justice subsequently. And now it has been brought again to the forefront and we are now hearing the news that this is placed under the order paper on the 3rd of October. The anti-terrorism bill as well as the online safety bill 
why is it that the government is trying to bring in legislation haphazardly at this point of time? Is it to please the international community? Well, I, I, I'm, I can tell you that this is very annoying because people like me, uh, who before talking about these things actually spend time studying it, it's quite a challenge for us. One day you have the anti-terror one and the next day you have the online safety and where's the time for these things? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what, pe what government motivations are, ministers' motivations are. I don't talk about things I don't, I know, I don't know. So I can tell you that uh, the anti-terrorism uh, bill that is uh, gazetted in September still has serious problems. Uh, we made representations to the Minister of Justice back in uh, April and of our representations only minimal changes have been made on two criteria and the third one which I consider the most important which is the normalization of powers normally exercised under the Public Security Act uh, which is the chapter or section 10 of the Anti-Terrorism Act has been untouched. And I believe that unless they are removed, uh, that bill should not go through. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rohan Samarjeeva, Chair of Learn Asia. We now move attention towards uh, Asela Vaidya Lankara, cyber security expert. Asela, what are your thoughts on the online safety bill? <clears throat> so, thank you, Shamir. Um, if you look at the bill, first of all, uh, it's quite uh, interesting to see the bill itself was gazetted on September 18th, whereas today is September 27th, and yet we've received a message that uh, this is to be taken up in Parliament in the order paper. Uh, that itself is a point of concern. Secondly, um, I'd like to focus on a few things. One is perhaps, uh, you know, you might slightly differ from me, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, let's talk about, I know it's a little... Uh, too early to say these things, but let's talk about some of the good as well. There are certain provisions that prevent doxing. Now, we know gender-based uh, gender online violence is a problem in the country. Uh, and I do agree that there are sometimes laws within the penal code itself. However, certainly we can take additional legal safeguards and measures, and certainly uh, there is precedent for that. So there are provisions here that cover doxing, that cover uh, certain aspects of that, that cover, you know, protection of children uh, from online harm. Uh, and certainly when it comes to elections, and we, we are hearing certain things that there might be elections next year. So, you know, to stop inauthentic behavior on social media, to basically stop influence operations that happen that may try to influence the outcome of election. We've seen that happening globally. So there are certain aspects of that that are included in this bill let me go to the bad the bad of course is the executive appoints the people there is no waiting uh, there is no security of tenure for the appointments uh, there is a very criteria set out here but we know that because there is no waiting and there is no transparency for example i would have liked something like the constitutional council to have a have a review of some of these appointments, but I'm told that requires a you know, constitutional amendment. But certainly, so those are the bad, and of course, the wide interpretations that, that are covered in this bill. The ugly is the way that they've gone out, the stakeholders that they've gone with. For example, they've identified internet service providers, they've identified something called internet intermediaries. Now, that's very uh, curious language, uh, and I believe what they're trying to go after here is social media platforms, uh, content aggregators, search engines, and even if they wish, messaging platforms. Now, this is a very dangerous trend because it keeps, puts us in a very uh, fragile footing because we are, we are not in a, the greatest places when it comes to our financial stability and so on and so forth. So the question remains, can we actually mandate some of the, the things that we are asking from, uh, from this particular law uh, with social media companies like Meta. When they do have their own code of conduct, when they are actually right now aligning to global standards, for example, the EU dis disinformation project, uh, Meta is part of that. So are the other social media companies. 
the US has very stringent disinformation guidelines. So in that atmosphere, I don't think it will succeed because we are trying to mandate these things uh, for these big tech companies. Additionally, we are requesting big tech companies to register with this particular commission. So I believe that uh, I'm, there's a very natural pushback that will come. Uh, Asar, you spoke about the three aspects, uh, namely you said the good, bad and the ugly. Yes. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit about the good aspects of this particular bill in question? One is... When uh, it comes to uh, the clauses itself? The clauses is, for, for example, um, this in a practice we call doxing, where f they've given illustration also here, mm -hmm. where when two people are in a relationship and some of their private information is shared online in different active purposes. So that's actually given as illustration in the bill and that's actually talked about. Secondly, we do see mentions of inauthentic online behavior, meaning, for example, if influence operations based in social media that will actually try to, for example, try to affect an outcome of an election. Now, these are things that have happened. There is precedent for this. And there are countries that have dealt with this, with the social media companies. Of course, a bit very differently to what's mentioned here. But still, it's mentioned and it is a good aspect. So these are some, and of course, uh, there's mention of online child pornography, so on and so forth. Uh, those are the good. I've mentioned the bad and I've mentioned the ugly as well. So in that sense, but my concern... Uh, at the look of it, isn't it a copy-paste of, of another bill in another country? Certain, some aspects, very much so. If you look at the wording of some of the interpretations, it's a copy-paste of the Singapore uh, Online Falsehood Act. Uh, certainly, they've taken inspiration from it uh, by the looks of it. Mm -hmm. There are some areas uh, word to word that's there but certainly they've added right. a little bit more as well right thank you very much uh, asana vaidya lankara cyber security expert i now move my attention towards ambika satkulanathan former commissioner of the human rights commission of sri lanka what are your thoughts on our topic tonight you used the phrase i think to ask dr samrajiva or uh, asela about uh, you said haphazard way actually it's not haphazard at all it's all very well thought out it is part of constructing a web of laws to violate our constitutionally protected rights, to uh, crack down on dissent, to crack down uh, on freedom of expression. Because we have we seen this consistently from even 2022. There was the Bureau of Rehabilitation Act. Then we have the anti-terrorism bill. And then now we have this. And we have the ATAs again. So we saw the amendment to the Poisons, Opium and Dangerous Drugs Ordinance. So it is not, and if you look at it, many of these laws, if enacted, they can be used in conjunction with each other to really crack down on civic rights. And uh, rather than calling it online safety bill, someone actually said, well, you know, when you talk about this, you should call it the internet censorship bill, because that is what the intent is, because we can't, I mean, when we are where the state or, you know, the government is concerned, how do we um, figure out their intention through the actions? And this government's actions clearly tell us what their intent is, right? Because the laws are not progressive. Uh, they constantly, the, the provisions all violate fundamental rights. And uh, so uh, there's a phrase that they use, and we, this is not uh, unique to Sri Lanka. We see this happening even in India, in other parts of the world. They call it digital authoritarianism. We see, uh, you know, elector, electoral authoritarianism. What is that? That is where we have democracy in uh, process in terms of, you know, elections, mm -hmm. but everything else, if you look at it, there really isn't much freedom or there are constant attempts to crack down on freedom, electoral authoritarianism. So this is one aspect of it, whereby it's digital authoritarianism, because we see increasingly online spaces are really uh, uh, drivers of protests. We saw that during Aragalia, we have seen that even in India, when they've had these massive protests against oppressive law. Laws. Therefore, that is the intention to crack down on this space because they've kind of got the physical space under control. So now they're trying to control the digital space, which has been difficult. So where the specific law is concerned, and we can go into this in detail, 
you know, if you look at the provisions, they are like the other, all the other laws that I mentioned before. They're overbroad, they're vague, uh, many of the terms here have no legal definition, and uh, there is no objective criteria which we can use to figure out even what this means. So this is actually a very uh, dangerous law, and the intent is quite clear. Uh, Ambika, Asira spoke about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly as far as uh, the bill is concerned. Do you see any good in this? Well, I mean, there are certain provisions, like even the ATA, even when I've spoken about it and written about it, there were very, very few provisions which uh, were positive in that. But that was maybe like 2%, 5%. So we are focusing on the 95%. So, you know, doxing, revenge porn, those provisions are there. But you can, as uh, I think Dr. Samarajiva said, uh, you can amend the penal code and include those. And some of the things, like for instance, contempt of court. Yeah. I mean, why do we need to include it here? And that, that even that provision is it, that's problematic for other reasons. There are also other offenses that we already have in other laws. Same thing which they did also with the ATA, with, you know, many of the other laws that I mentioned where we have it in other laws but they bring it under a different umbrella with more oppressive uh, provision. Uh, Ambika, with regard to the composition of the um, online safety commission where the president has the full authority to appoint members to the commission in question and remove them just by giving a reason, do you see a problem here as well? Well, yes, and I thought that was the whole purpose of the 19th Amendment and then the 21st Amendment, right, supposedly, was to prevent this kind of presidential appointment to ensure that the appointment to these commissions, which are supposed to uh, uh, function in an independent, transparent manner and hold the state accountable, that appointments to these would be also transparent. Mm. And those people can be held accountable, whereas if you have the president appointing, it is at his pleasure. They serve at the president's pleasure. How does that help us when we already have a president, the executive, who has, um, you know, um, well, too much power, which we've been trying to control for decades in this country with very little success? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambika Satkaranadhan, former commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. I now move my attention towards uh, Dr. Rohan Dattakorala, country head of Clutrack Software Labs, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Pakistan. Uh, Rohanda, what are your thoughts uh, on this bill in question? Does that raise an eyebrow as far as tech companies are concerned? Thank you, Shamir, for having me on the program. It's a very uh, interesting uh, proposition that the government has brought in. Um, as you know, last quarter, uh, corporate earnings tumbled by 45%. Uh, to just rupees 53 billion and uh, companies are just struggling to get out of a macro perspective um, as you know first quarter economy declined by 11.5 percent second quarter it declined by 3.1 percent so we are struggling to hold our consumers in our business that's our challenge and we know that consumption has dropped we know that uh, people's purchasing habits have changed because their purchasing power is uh, under pressure. And, and whilst we are trying to see as to how we can move cost, we see that last year advertising spend has picked up by 14% to 162 billion Sri Lankan rupees. Now, mainly it's driven by TV and now it's slowly moving to digital. And that's a huge shift that companies take, Shamir. Because, uh, as you know, TV builds brand equity and we know that digital media is easier on our purse and you're taken that shift and you're getting feedback from consumers. We are waiting to understand what consumers say. And right now, when this bill comes to play and we know that everybody is questioning this, what happens is people will be more cautious in the kind of feedback that they give and that's going to hurt our businesses because we use this consumer feedback for market research purposes to understand and if you're going to question and cautious of what you're saying what happens is that you're going to further make business more complex and we know that for the last 10-15 years one of the biggest challenges that companies have is the consistency of policy and the ease of doing business index and we are now further bringing another complexity to this we are telling if you're going to go digital on marketing, well, we have certain stipulations that you need to follow. 
if you guys violate you are liable to be arrested if you if a consumers give feedback and it's only a platform like what Asilo was saying then chances are that what wha, what do you do when a consumer gives feedback so you are adding complexity to the overall dynamics of doing business and this is not what the country wants right now what the country right now wants is investment to come in they want more companies to do business in the country they want to expand and you want to see how you can propagate a, a po positive economic outlook and we know that things are rough in this context you know coming with these kinds of propositions where you're trying to curtail uh, people's share of voice is going to hurt business and to me uh, from a very business point of view what is this overall bigger game plan uh, that the country policy makers have because from one side you go to the UN you can meet the w, uh, World Bank and you meet the key people who are looking at Sri Lanka for business including the South, uh, South um, Korean president and you're saying our country is open for business please come over we are waiting to take you on board to see as to how we could do joint partnerships we are looking at India for free trade agreements and, and we are looking at trying to move the CEPA agreement from FTA now while from one side you are saying we are open for business from another side we are adding complexity and that complexity further adds pressure to the how you manage a business so I, right now there is an uproar among brand marketing companies there is an uproar with regard to how does this bill act in terms of um, how you do business and, and they are saying that nobody has even consulted anybody uh, as on when this bill and regulation was to come in. So this is the challenge that and the perspective that I would come onto this. Uh, Rohanta, in terms of regulating social media, uh, I was of the opinion that uh, most of these companies, uh, social media tech giants like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, they are self-regulated, isn't it? If you look at uh, countries like the UK, uh, there are bills where social media companies are legally responsible for keeping children and young people safe online. Uh, so there are bills regulating social media, but do you think that Sri Lanka requires a bill where actions are taken against individuals who express their opinions? Shamit, that's exactly the argument that I'm also coming to. I mean, if you are bringing in regulation, first of all, you need to see if there's a problem. And if that problem is either to the politicians or is this problem to business. Now, if the businesses find that there is no problem, as to what basis do you bring regulation? Are you bringing regulation to improve the economic growth? So let me, let me interrupt you there. Dr. Harshad Silva was speaking to the media recently said that uh, tech giants like Facebook, um, uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter might even leave the country as a result of such regulations. Do you see a threat of that sort see, uh, in, in, in the country? As at now, there is no statement. But we don't know when you say online media whether it includes WhatsApp. Now, if it's WhatsApp, it's encrypted. But the question is if there is a, a legal uh, direction that they want to have domain access, then how does this proposition work? Because that is their overall value profit to the consumer, which means that they would say, ah, we are going to withdraw. So the point here is that the people who have architectured this, they have not brought out what is the strategy behind this. There are no architects, Rohan. <laughs> <laughs> we are still trying to find out who drafted this bill in question. Um, so let me open the floor for questions from our journalist, on to immediate right, as I said before, is Niresh Adithambi. Uh, Consultant News Director, English News Director at News First, and then I have Sandra on to my immediate left. Niresh, with your permission, shall we start off with Sandra? Yes, certainly. Yes. Thank you, Shamir. Uh, I think uh, my question would be to uh, Asela, when, uh, with regards to the Act itself, the Bill itself, pardon me, uh, there is uh, in uh, Clause number Article 11, it says the Commission shall have the following powers and functions, and it says to issue directives to persons, and it goes on. Uh, to say who have published or communicated or whose services have been used to communicate any prohibited statement. Now this word prohibited statement has been repeated multiple times. Yes. 
in this bill, yes. as the limbs have noticed. And as a professional, in your opinion, now, if we go on to Article 56, also it says prohibited statement means a statement specified in Section 12, 13, uh, 11, 14, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17. 18, 19, 20, 21, <laughs> and which there in itself so, are ambiguous. Uh, <laughs> you would agree. Not, yes. Uh, uh, that is a joke uh, for. When you say, the and listen, you must be able to articulate. Uh, as a draftman, what do you mean by prohibited statement? No, it's because, a joke to the legal community. Uh, because in your in your opinion, Nasila, what is a prohibited statement in the? Because you are a professional in uh, the tech sphere. What is a prohibited statement in general, as accepted as per the norms? When you say prohibited statement, uh, Sandro, I don't think. We see again. Uh, this is one thing that uh, when I spoke previously with Shamir, also I highlighted the broad nature of of certain definitions. So prohibited statement is very ambiguous because there's, as, as I mentioned, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 goes on right up to 23. Uh, and of course, it ropes in so many people to make sure that they monitor these prohibited statements. They identify people called service providers, which is, I'm assuming, internet service providers. Then they're saying internet intermediaries. Now, probably what they've done is they've taken this from uh, the, the Online Falsehood Act from Singapore uh, and they've used Internet Access Service Provider and it means an entity offering transmission, routing, so on and so forth. But the Singapore Act actually goes on to say social network services, search engines, content aggregation services, internet messaging services and video sharing. What they're trying to say here is they're looking at disinformation or malicious information that is being spread at malicious, for a malicious purpose with intent. That is what they're trying to say. But unfortunately, it's given, it's painted in such a broad brush here that they've actually lost the entire plot of what they're trying to do. And like I said, if you are going to, if you're genuine about online safety, certainly you have to focus and start talking to these stakeholders. These are wide ranging stakeholders, internet service providers on one hand, you have your social media companies on the other who would push back. I, I definitely foresee within the next couple of days, social media giants will push back. And you have then uh, uh, certain other parties. You have, uh, since Dr. Dr. Rohanta mentioned, even digital uh, advertising agencies yeah. are identified. Basically, if the commission declares that a person is giving a prohibited statement and Lo and behold, some digital advertising agency is running that ad on social media. They are also brought under the purview to say that they are also in violation of this. So you can see how broad uh, of the terms that they have brought in here. And it shows a lack of stakeholder consultation, honestly. Because there's so much of parties involved here, there's so many moving parts. Those e parties independently have their own you know, concerns that they want to raise. Especially if you are going to deal with parties like Meta, who has a great social media footprint. You have to come with facts and policies, Rohanta also mentioned, why you are doing this? What are you trying to tackle? And are there other alternative ways and means of tackling? For example, inauthentic online behavior. Inauthentic online behavior specifically speaks about election interference and certainly interference of the state on certain matters. Take that up because there is a mechanism, for example, Meta has where you can sit down with them and come up with it. And if it's something elections that you're worried about, you can set up. Because a we saw we saw ourselves uh, something of that sort taking place after the April 21st attacks in Sri Lanka in Absolutely. 2019, Absolutely. where the Sri Lankan government had a direct dialogue with uh, Facebook Meta. officials yes. and told them that uh, such content is going to uh, spread hatred in the country as and as such. Please take action against uh, individuals who are uh, putting up posts that uh, spread uh, racism in the country. So it worked out quite well at that time. Well, they did have shutdowns. They did shut down Meta after April. It, it, it did. But right? if you are looking yeah. at prohibited statements, the section you should look at is section 26. That's the critical section in this act. In section 26, the way it would work is, and that's where it differs significantly from the Singapore case. Mm -hmm. Any human being can go to this entity, I call it the Online Truth Commission or something. <laughs> 19 years. Uh, it can go to it and say, I'm aggrieved. I think some harm has been done. And then there is supposed to be an information officer and he's supposed to take this up. 
unilaterally without allowing the party that gave the that was responsible for the for the message unilaterally they can issue under section 26 they can issue uh, they can say it's a prohibited statement that is they decide it's false that is this truth commission decides it's false and they declare it a prohibited statement and says gives a notice saying no you will not disseminate it within 24, 24 hours. hours within 24 hours within yeah. 24 hours if it's not taken down then they go to the platform and they are also told now take it down and 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 it goes on and isp as well yeah so you just keep going so that's why i said that it is against the basic principles because no the other side is not given a hearing given a chance to explain their position unilaterally they give a stop board and then it es keeps escalating it keeps escalating to a level where the fine that could be levied on a platform will be 1 million sri lanka rupees uh, 10 million uh, f on the first instance and then for every day that they don't uh, follow the rules another million right now of course good luck trying to put uh, put these fines on on uh, meta or somebody else that's completely unrealistic but that's section 26 is where you got to look at for the heart of this act there is a section 27 that involves a magistrate <laughs> but i personally think that's there for just for color uh, it's there just to help them get through uh, constitutional review because otherwise if you really think about it you have a entity that is completely on the executive side actually making addition as to what is true and false without following the rules of natural justice without hearing both sides and taking action punishing them no fines yet but punishing them there is another provision uh, which is however unfortunate which is there is a provision which says that not following a direction by the commission is an offense mm. Mm. right so now commission gives a directive and the only thing that is to be heard before this the magistrate is did you follow the directive or not because the offense has been defined that way was the directive based on uh, any kind of proper procedure uh, no so that's very unfortunate but these are all snuck in there because they are aware the people who drafted it are aware that this is going to come in for mm. heavy challenge by the by various uh, parties that will challenge it and but, the supreme uh, court will will basically change quite a bit of this but professor Duhan, now if we look at sri lanka we live in a country where famous scandals of certain athletes are uh, uh, messages being exchanged are being publicized by certain institutions and uh, Personal privacy is not respected. Doxing is also a big problem, like Asil mentioned earlier. So, uh, do you not even slightly believe that there are some good sides to this? My first question: good sides to this uh, bill, number one, because even previously, if I'm not mistaken, last February as well, Shehan Simasinghe or uh, a certain minister tried to bring in this uh, code of uh, conduct for social media. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, these things have come up multiple times on and on in history, codes of conduct. You mentioned about in industry code as well. How many codes of conduct will happen before young girls, young women's lives are ruined? How many codes of conducts are required until men and women, young people are violated in their privacy in Sri Lanka until a certain strong legislature can be brought? Well, I don't think, I think the, the, the key to understanding it is, you see, people are harmed by print media right i don't have to go on about what happened to dr shafi his family his life his career everything was ruined by print media and by electronic media right so there are bad things that happen through through content right messages i i have no dispute about that i think action should be taken about mainstream media to start with and then action should be taken about social media what is different about social media, what's different about online is the rapidity, is the fact that there are no editors and publishers in social media. So you have millions of people who are potentially capable of posting messages, right? There are no choke points. And then the second unique feature is it goes very fast. 
if you recall the, the Christchurch massacre where this monster strapped a, a body camera onto himself and then went around killing people <laughs> and live streaming it, that was put on Facebook. And however much they tried to take it down, it was being taken by other people and disseminated. So, rapidity of takedown is what our central objective of this kind of thing should be. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, who is capable of rapidly taking down offensive content? Is it the tech companies or is it a government organization that is going to be underfunded and will be saying, ah, did you send it in using the registered post? Did you do this? Did you do that? By the time they get the act together, all the damage will be done. So that's why I said this is an ineffective piece of legislation. If your central concern, which is my central concern, is the rapidity of takedown, don't do it this way. Do it through an industry code. And we have an industry code that has been framed by people in Sri Lanka uh, with the participation and the buy-in of the tech companies. And I think it can be implemented tomorrow, basically. It's ready. Uh, and we have precedent in other countries. Right. So, uh, Ambika, I just, when I was reading through this uh, bill in question, I saw this aspect called illustrations. Um, mm -hmm. And this illustrations clearly says that X and Y were formed in a relationship which oh, had since yeah. ended and goes on to elaborate um, yeah. an incident. Uh, don't you think this, it, this itself is vague? Because if it's a piece of legislation that comes into play, why should there be any less illustration? Uh, articulating no, yeah. um, a, a, an incident. No, I mean that is common because even if you when you take other legislation, the illustration is there and uh, going to Sandro's question, uh, you know, and we've said it several times, if your intention is about doxing, if it is about revenge porn, well then why don't you focus on that, mm -hmm. right? Several points I would like to pick up on what was said before. Firstly, section 26, the complaint, any person can make a complaint, an aggrieved person. The problem here is that and I've never heard this before, being part of a commission for five years, apparently orally you can make complaints. Really, how does that work? Because you say it, but the, you do need to write your complaint. We need to have evidence of it. How are you going to investigate it? All that, right? So it says orally. And um, then, of course, the fact is, why do you have uh, the commission being able to issue this directive? And then you also have a magistrate, the person can approach the magistrate directly. That makes absolutely no sense. Thirdly, none of the commissions, not even the Human Rights Commission, which inquires into torture, one of the worst human rights violations known to human beings, the Human Rights Commission uh, can only issue recommendations. The commission cannot issue uh, directives, cannot issue orders. And, uh, you know, failure to implement an order or a, a recommendation, we can't, the Commission can't do anything. Can only report to Parliament through the President. Whereas here, apparently, you know, this Commission is given so many powers when a Commission that investigates torture is not, it doesn't have enforceable powers. So that's what I'm saying. The intent here is very clear. And also you we were talking about uh, the definition, no, about you asked about the definition. What is a um, prohibited, prohibited. prohibited statement? So, you know, I went through the definitions. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, what's the definition of fact, right? Yes. So the definition of a fact according to the bill is it includes anything or state of things which are seen, heard or otherwise perceived perceived okay. different people perceive things differently right perceived by the users of internet based communication services the oxford university defines oxford uh, dictionary defines fact as a thing that is known or proved to be true so it's like it is you know it's like uh, they they are trying to uh, completely upend our version of reality here is what they're trying to do mm -hmm. and it also shows contempt for the citizens of Sri Lanka that you define fact this way you say something is a prohibited statement yet there is no definition of it yet the Commission can make decisions that impinge upon freedom of expression based on that it shows complete contempt for us and disregard for the Constitution and the rule of law um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, it is very clear. There are many other provisions as well, for instance, that is problematic, which is, uh, it says that for the purpose of uh, 
purposes of an investigation under this act, they can have um, enlist experts, right? And guess what the power of the expert is. An expert who has been called upon to assist the police may, with the authority granted by a police officer, not below the rank of sub-inspector. Um, how on earth can a sub-inspector uh, delegate their power mm. to a private citizen and the, through, through that power, let's say our sailor is the expert <laughs> who oh, is, yeah. uh, you know, our sailor will be able to require any person, yes. even me, Producing. to produce any document, information, device or other thing as is necessary for the purpose of investigation. So our sailor, the expert, can just tell Ambika, I need your phone because I need, there is no court order. Uh, and the police officer just supposedly delegates the authority to a private mm -hmm. citizen to ask for various documents, demand, etc., from another private citizen. How many rights does that violate? So, and I like I, to add, I, I uh, states, I, I states also, uh, any person who fails to comply with any directive issued in respect of such person by the commission, under paragraph C of section 11, within 24 hours of its receipt, commits an offence and shall on conviction be liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years to a fine not exceeding one million rupees in the event of a second or subsequent conviction. So, the commission has a lot of power. But that's what was my point is the human rights, now the police would completely disregard the human rights commission's recommendations on torture, right? Where's the accountability? How can we hold them accountable? We can't. They ignore it. They do not implemented and we can't do anything about it it is not an offense they're not held accountable but here apparently this commission is very special it is given powers that none of the other commissions are currently given and those commissions are appointed under the 21st amendment by constitutional council this special commission is appointed by the, by the yeah, president yeah. and serve at his pleasure which means they will also perform their fun functions at his pleasure, right? And upon his directions, one would imagine. Um, Dr. Rohatka, let me ask you. Um, now, we, we keep going around human rights, freedom of expression and all that. But what it will be the, the, the practical impact on the economy, on commerce? For example, let's take uh, one of the huge areas in law, trademarks. Trademark disputes are everywhere. Um, but in this case, um, where there is a complete violation of the principles of, viol of natural justice, um, what happens if one company uh, goes and uh, complains that its trademark is being violated by another one? Uh, what would happen in such a situation? Well, uh, <laughs> or, or, or to simplify it even more, one comp company says, we are number one, and the other one says, no, we are number one. Now what happens? Uh, th does the company website get taken down? Which is Naresh, the exact challenge that we have on this bill. I mean, look at section 15. It says any person, whether in or outside Sri Lanka, who communicates falsehood, voluntarily causes disturbance to any lawfully engaged performance of religious worship. Now, 65% of the tourists who come to Sri Lanka goes to Talda Maligawa. And Ambika talked about how you define a fact, how you can, mm. they would explain and give comments based on a perception of what they have, which is also part of a definition of a fact. So, you talked about one, I am giving you another option. What happens if he or she gives a fact and, and then you find that it is, it is going to be against religious worship and religious ceremonies. Do we... Uh, uh, arrest the person because it says here mm -hmm. either description of term exceeding three years or to find both such imprisonment fine in the event of second or subsequent conviction such term will be both for some people may be doubled. Now the question is how does tourism exist in this? Even before we go to um, IP intellectual property the question is about you know that tourism is large. We know that we are looking at people to come to Sri Lanka. We are touched one million tourists coming into Sri Lanka today. Now, we wait to understand their views to see as to how, what the brand drivers are of a particular property. What are their category drivers and then how the property needs to fashion themselves based on this. Now, if they are not going to give you feedback and we know that TripAdvisor and all the different blogs want to give their own perspective, 
because we want we get feedback from this we immediately go and talk to the customer tomorrow in the morning but then this time they are scared to give their perspective but because that's not that's not that's covered not, actually yeah. it's not covered from if you look from section yeah. 12 to section 23 they are the offenses yeah in most of these cases it's you know vague stuff ill will between classes mm. really just i don't know hurt or all kinds of stuff but it doesn't say intellectual property right it doesn't say you know you i said something bad about a hotel or a restaurant it specifically says certain kinds of speech it has odd stuff online impersonation for some reason they call it online personation exactly i have no idea why why they use this english word, word personation instead of impersonation there's one on cheating mm. various things but I, i think you know i'd be very i'd be very comfortable uh, maligning uh, or saying negative things about a restaurant uh, yeah after having studied this act I, i i would have no problem the point is going to be religious worship yeah religious there's That a is, lot my of my question is on religious worship for instance mm-hmm. i'm very clear 65% of the tourists goes to dalda marigaba if by chance a tourist says something which is going to be against and it's factual based on what they perceive how what action do you take against so the then tourists? that person now let's take that case that's a good case hmm. so if a tourist says something right something Say it's too crowded something like no 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 something or, that would outrage outrage, outrage or, or wound um, religious dis- feeling yeah. right? this, religious is a, this is a undefined vague term right this is what they tried with shaktika satkumar shaktika satkumar who has been held to be completely exonerated uh, not guilty and so on he said that there was homosexual activity going on in a temple in a short story right now that was supposed to outrage somebody's feelings okay so whatever this outrage business has happened there's no definition that individual whose feelings have been out, religious feelings have been outraged would have to go under section 26 to this uh, truth commission or under section 27 to the magistrate and say my uh, feelings have been outraged and here's the section they will have to determine that it is a false statement that's why i call it the truth commission they will have to make a determination either the commission or the magistrate that it is false and then false and causing religious hurt you get those elements now the the man is on the hook right now if i said i went to the dalda maliga when it was crowded uh, i think it's a bit of a stretch to say that would for qualify as a falsehood and that it would cause religious hurt but i'll tell you one thing that might impact but now uh, we have uh, uh, now it seems to me that you've uh, switched gears because initially you said there's a good bad and uh, bad i, I still maintain but, that shame but you, now i you still maintain be, that uh, i i, I be, still <laughs> say there are certain to, uh, certain bad elements. and the only yes no no yeah. but there are certain yeah, elements and and it's yes. open for debate uh, yes. among the three of you uh, i i stand by that point but i'll take section so do you agree do you agree to the fact that when ambika said there's 2% uh, good in usually the acts that are brought by the government in the last few months do you agree with the 2% or i i, I will 2 to 5 man 2 to 5% uh, you know. let's, okay. let's, uh, let's, well, let's 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 debate on the percent that's quibbling about you know let's let's debate on the percentages but what i'm trying to tell you is you know when you look at this the any legislation and because it's he herself said even the ata there are certain aspects that are good so here also looking at it very critically there are certain things that we can take that's but don't bad. you think don't you think the laws in sri lanka is adequate enough to take action against those individuals who are deemed as perpetrators as far as the act is concerned then why does only 3% of people who face online violence in this country go to law enforcement only 3% because there is a the systematic there is a problem how i can't a, a lady who's faced sexual harassment online can't go to a police station or even uh, if that i'm sure ambika has better stories but, but asel that is true in normal life uh, no but uh, but what i'm trying about online no that's yeah. true but why then why then we have a computer crimes act because certainly we can cover everything under the penal code there are instances where as technology matures now there are the technology legislations out there we need to be conscious of that and law makers and policy makers need to build now, laws we have now we in sri lanka we have a securities and exchange commission act right 
when has an individual been uh, see Shami, taken enforcement into is one, yeah. enforcement is one <laughs> thing regard to <coughs> conflict of interest and then we say there are millionaires <laughs> coming from the stock market so listen it can't be one instance now so, we, we, my, my point example, is this with regard to enforcement you know you are talking about the 3% Let's talk about generally with the laws that are already prevalent in the country. No, you are talking about the conviction. No, I'm talking about even coming into the system because they fall off. That's what I'm saying. But I'll come back to the point I was saying. Section 19, because there's a, a lot of influencers that come into the country. And uh, we talk about, uh, Doc also said it, personation. Now, what if they do satire? What if, if they do some sort of parody? And there are content creators out there who do it right now itself. Mm. Are we to say that now those chaps also, mm. and certainly they make a living out of it because of the views and uh, certainly the income they generate, are we to say that they fall under this? Because there are people out there who personate doctor, themselves as political figures, yes? So are we to say that these guys are also to be, because somebody might see it, like Doc said, and uh, go and make a complaint? There's a whole series of provisions where the platform companies they have, can be ordered to disclose the identities of various people. Yeah. Exactly. And then they will be subject to penalties if they don't disclose. Exactly. So imagine if you are running a parody account, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's say on X or Twitter, yeah. uh, you know, will you ask them to now disclose who you are with your... And of but course, based on this, you have to. You have and, to. And what about the fake account? The thing is whether they can exactly. or not. Because see, my question always was, now let's take India for instance. In 2021, India brought the, the what they call short form internet rules, right? Very insidious uh, rules, which said, for instance, that the tech companies had to appoint uh, a resident Indian mm. as their enforcement officer, and he was he could be criminally liable. So it was a way of holding them hostage. Within three days of uh, the government demanding that a platform take down information, they had to take it down. They had to even provide. Um, uh, you know, details of individuals if the government so requested. Now, you would have imagined that the tech companies, big tech, would have pushed back. Not really. They didn't, right? But that's also because India is a massive market and we compare that to Sri Lanka. Frankly, they don't have to abide okay. by anything because there they said they gave three months for them to implement it. They did not. They thought they could push back on it. They could not. Uh, they abided by it. Twitter didn't because Twitter didn't in three months. What they did is Twitter lost its intermediary status, which meant that anything posted on Twitter, Twitter would be liable for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you thought big tech, but immediately what did they do when they lost the status? They abided by it. So the status was restored. Right. So hoping that big tech would push back is a bit of a dream if we look at what's happening within the region but of course our saving grace is that we aren't a huge market like <laughs> India and therefore there is no need for them to abide by any of this right how how, how is the government going to enforce it if I'm not mistaken Sri Lanka has a wide market for a range of other things on the internet uh, Dr. Rohant I have a question <laughs> for you uh, when it comes to now we spoke about the good the bad and the ugly but what about the things not spoken in this, especially regarding corporates and those uh, in the uh, tech sphere? So for example, cryptocurrency is something that uh, personally myself, I've questioned two central bank governors. Why is there no legislation on it? Uh, has uh, have not responded properly. Uh, cryptocurrency is one thing. Well, proxy servers and how people steal information via proxy servers. Multiple issues with that. Sure, so would also agree. And what about intellectual property, because you all spoke about it as well, what about property, intellectual property, privacy, stolen through proxy servers and other lots of issues, because the issue of proxy servers came about with VPNs during the social media blackouts as well. These have costed a lot for corporates, if I'm not mistaken, when it comes to information, etc. What do you have to say about these parts that are not addressed? Because we feel like this entire act is something that they failed to do. Uh, with the ATA, even despite the recommendations of the Human Rights Council as well, Human Rights Commission in Sri Lanka. Now they're trying to bring it to the digital sphere, like it was said before. Now in this digital sphere, they've addressed human rights, but what about these things that have been long-standingly not addressed in the corporate sphere, in the IT sphere as well? So that's the reason why we are saying that consultation is important. I mean, you have a SLASCOM, which has all the tech people represented. I mean, they should have been consulted. 
I mean, not only the cyber security experts, but also the Slashcom people who basically drive the whole IT industry. Uh, I mean, <coughs> Sandra, I, I take your point that there are good to it also. Like, for instance, you know, from a marketing perspective, uh, you know, you have false accounts. Then you have people who tend to comment on your brand without proper data, you know. So, sometimes this particular ad can force you to be a little bit more authentic on the data that you get. So, there are many aspects that has to be covered, which this particular act doesn't cover. But I'm very, very conscious more on the, more than the tech on tourism. See, even in clause 17, it says, if you were to outrage any religious feelings and when foreigners come, they could always make any kind of a statement. What is the signal that we give? to the global entities. And this is in a backdrop where just uh, last week at the Carnegie Endowment, the president said that uh, one of our biggest tracks is tourism and we want to push the private sector because the state sector can't do it. He explicitly said that, didn't he? Absolutely. And, and we know that religious tourism is big. It's a, it's, a, it's a large market globally. And especially if you take the Indian market, you drive on religious tourism. Now, how do you drive and develop a global image if, if this is what you're going to do in terms of consumer protection. See, governments are here to protect consumers, not to, not to protect their seat, which, which is not coming out. So so they here to protect citizens, Do, but Hunter, that is that, uh, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, just as uh, legal bodies like, like the BASL are uh, having some say, uh, at least publicly, uh, do you think that the Chambers of Commerce and uh, uh, you spoke of tourism, uh, the uh, travel bodies, they should also be giving their input into absolutely uh, uh, i mean Rish, of... before i came here i had a chat with different perspectives to understand their view and what they're saying is there's absolute confusion people are calling and asking what happens if i make this comment what happens if a consumer makes a comment and it's on a brand platform and that's so, exactly what's uh, what's required <laughs> and then one more thing uh, you have telcos telcos are having a tough time right now yeah uh, they've had a tough year tough quarters uh, they've been taxed and on top of that you're placing something that's not even their core business content moderation or policing this and you're asking them to look at it you're asking then an expert to come Ambika and look at traffic analysis <laughs> so basically I could walk yeah. into the, the servers of dialogue and demand yep, traffic data uh, from from these people yeah. and certainly that is the you know you are you actually going to burden let's let's park meta for the Meta and the social media platforms, they're big enough. They're billion trillion dollar companies. Are you actually going to burden the telcos with more regulation like this? With, uh, you know, burdensome, overreaching, stifling regulation like this? Is that what you want? So, I mean, Certainly. that's the point I was also bringing, which is that what is the objective of this? I mean, I said I brought out the telcos. We know that the telcos are most of the companies are on the red. And they're trying to understand what are the new requirements that are there, what new products they can launch. Because the overall economy is down. Anyway. And, and you are trying to bring in legislation to make the ease of business further going no, down. On, in on terms top of, of this, anyway, there are certain proper uh, regulations. For example, the Personal Data Protection Act. Telcos have a big say on, obviously, personal data. They have to structurally change. There are certain technical uh, stuff they have to do. They are doing that because certainly this... Uh, the PDPA, for example, is a good act and it keeps us in very good standing and we are aligned to the EU Act uh, and that would attract investments. Now, on top of that, there's a cyber security bill that's coming. There also, telcos might be designated critical national infrastructure. There also, they need to make sure that their technology is there, they need to invest in those. Now, this is on top of investing in a 5G expansion, uh, maintaining your networks, which is a costly activity in US dollar terms. Yeah. Now, on top of that, you are telling me, by the way, you have to look at the online safety also, because there are, there's a commission here, we'll send you regulations within 24 hours, you also have to make sure people's access is uh, contained and limited. By the way, access to the internet is considered a fundamental right by the UN. Indian Supreme Court also has recognized mm. that. But they keep uh, shutting it down. Are we to say, <laughs> exactly, doctor, are we <laughs> to say, your fundamental right? are we to say <laughs> that we are actually, I mean, Obviously, we haven't given that wider interpretation, but globally, this is the benchmark. And are we to say that we are taking a step back? And the tech industry, and I know 
uh, the tech industry will come out with, uh, I'm confident about that, they will come out with a statement uh, um, not agreeing with this. Look at the tech industry. This is, I feel, a thrust sector that will save us. This is a sector that will take us out of this economic crisis faster than others. I know tourism is there. But are we to go to our European partners? Are we to go to our US clients and say, we come from a country that is of such nature? Can we do that? And of course, like Dr. said, listen, this Pakistan tried to do the same thing in 2020. Fail. 70 million customers there. Meta actually put chips on the table and said, listen, we are pulling out. 10 million customers is what Sri Lanka has. Nothing. 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 Uh, these are, you know, they have billions of users. 10 million customers. Is Probably billion. that is what the government wants. No, but I but think. But let's unpack that a little, that one. You see, people talk about that uh, provision regarding requiring registration. It doesn't say, the act itself doesn't say registration is required. It says regulations may be, may be made that will require registration. Nobody's going to register, right? But more insidious is a different provision, which says that when an interim order is issued against an intermediary company, i.e. a platform company, they have to give their side of the story within seven days to the magistrate. If you don't give your side of the story within seven days, and whether you're served papers or not, the, the, the system is going to assume that you've been served papers, and seven days you have, and if you don't respond, the order will be made final, and then the finals will start kicking in. Mm -hmm. What that means is they've got to have some people here the whose only job is to watch for this, <laughs> these orders that are coming. Mm -hmm. So now de facto, somebody was talking about the Indian provisions where they wanted to have every company have an in, in-person office in the country. Yeah, now de facto, they will create that. And most of these guys, I mean, I have talked to them, they are not willing to do that. They say, if I put a put an office in your country, I'll have to put it in 200, 200 plus countries. countries. I'm yes. not going to do that. That's against my business model, right? So that means that they will basically become either scofflaws, which is, I think, rather disrespectful of the law in our country, mm. or they will walk away and say, what kind of piddling market is this? We don't need, need you. And, and uh, one thing I would like to make is there are so many SMEs reliant on these platforms. Imagine in, in, yeah, in yeah, that in a, in a situation, hypothetically, they decide to walk away. Think of all the small businesses that will fall. Yeah. Think of the impact content creators might have, who are exclusive to these social media platforms. They'll be completely without uh, a way of uh, earning. I mean, Is that what we sorry, want? Yeah. Sorry. No, if I may, I mean, Rohanta and um, Asela um, speaking about the impact that will have on the business community. Okay. I think what that shows to us is that it's very important for the business community to care about human rights, that it is relevant because the intention, the reason that none of you can make sense of this and you're like, why are they doing this is because you're viewing it from a purely rational business perspective. But that is not the perspective from which the government comes. Their aim is to crack down on dissent, to limit freedom of expression, to limit civic rights, to uh, expand authoritarianism and to gain greater control. If you look at it within that framework, you will understand it. Of course, we know our successive governments have been short-sighted. They do not see the impact that it has on the economy, on businesses, which is why we need businesses to start caring about human rights because we're all connected. Absolutely. And one of us gets hit. You might not get hit now and you didn't get hit for a long time but you're getting hit now, right? So uh, I think that we need to, and also if I may, one, a few things, now you, you were talking about section 16, no, I had noted that, 16 and 17, this whole thing about outraging the religious feelings of any class of uh, persons, attempts to insult, I mean, these are, we've seen all over the world, words that are used, which are very nebulous, no legal definition, vague, overbroad, used to say anything and everything, like the woman was wearing a ship wheel, dress, Shaktika Satkumara, Anaf Jazim, the poet. But also there is something else that is going on, which is not spoken about, which is like the white elephant in the room in this country, which is that we particularly see this in the north and the east, 
there are places which we call sites of contestation, religious contestation, because there have been uh, Hindu temples there, and we see the, the Buddhist monks along with the military and the Department of Archaeology, they go and take over the place. So there are people who are protesting. They're talking about contempt of court. Well, that's very funny because we've had ministers who have violated court orders. We have members of parliament threatening judges right in parliament not contempt of court now those are actual acts and here they're talking about a statement they're saying any communication that may be in contempt of court what about actually violating a court order there's a minister who did that in terms of the contested place right uh, nothing happens uh, so i mean these i think these sections because they talk about um, intention of wounding the religious feelings of any other person it is also to crack down on people, on political uh, parties, on civic activists, on communities in the north and the east that are protesting. Now they are protesting peacefully and they are using the courts and the courts are giving orders but the orders are being disregarded. Right. So these provisions are also about that, to try and crack down on dissent there and this other uh, section actually which is quite similar to section 120 of the penal code mm. which if you remember was under the uh, section under which Anuruddha um, the oh, An Malika was taken and also that. Anuruddha the mm. one who was part of the Aragla I forget his mm. um, name mm. there was a it was a big uproar if you remember at the time at the beginning of that uh, this he was taken under that that is exciting or attempt to attempting to excite disaffection towards the president and the government right vague, overbroad, frankly regressive, out of date provision which we must repeal. So section 12 is also quite similar to that. It says anyone who poses a threat to national security, public health or public order or promotes feeling of ill will and hostility between different classes of people uh, by communicating a false statement. So yes, I, I just want to uh, yeah. pose a question on that um, Ambika. Now it says uh, any person, whether in or outside Sri Lanka, who poses a threat to national security, mm -hmm. public health or public order, or promotes feelings of ill will and hostility mm -hmm. between different classes of people by communicating a false statement, mm -hmm. commits an offence and shall, on conviction, mm -hmm. be liable to an imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years or to a fine and in the event of a second or mm -hmm. subsequent conviction, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that an individual cannot express their opinions about um, <laughs> about uh, the country's uh, national security, public health, um, may it be the country's economy, which is I now under contention at the moment. Um, it has to be false. Yeah. But who decides false? That and also, no. and also when they define fact in this non factual way, how do you decide? So does that mean does that mean let's say the commission in question or let's say the president does not like my face? And he thinks that um, I don't like him and henceforth instructs the commission, please investigate because the commission is not independent, is appointed by the president. The commission they can, can get take someone, action. They can get someone. So, for instance, mm. I'm constantly talking about national security, the military, the police, mm. the PTA, the public security ordinance, right? They could say that I uh, pose a threat to national security. Mm. There are people telling me that I have to be careful, actually, about what I say. A uh, uh, threat to national security, then I'm... I talk about, I talk about Sinhala Buddhist nationalism, right? I talk about the military and the Buddhist monks getting together. So in other words, you can be taken in. Well, Absolutely, yeah. I can be taken in. They will say I am promoting feelings so, of ill will. I mean, not only and, that, uh, we can be taken in for having her on the show. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep. and, That's and right. Also, yeah. your website can be told to take this content exactly down because when you, you stream it. it. And, and exactly. It's all about about LK and even your YouTube. <laughs> it's all about who's truth it is, isn't it? That's exactly. the point. Exactly. Who's exactly. Truth? Truth. So, so this entity will determine what is true and what is not true. And that is, I mean, at some point, somebody in society has to decide, right? But for that, we have the courts. Because the courts do say that is a true statement, that is untrue. And then we have a, have a procedures. Uh, both sides must be heard, uh, the judge must be impartial, etc., etc. Et the rules of Natural justice. This has nothing. So, we so that's why I said this is 
fundamentally against the principles of natural justice. Professor Rupan, if I may interject yes. a little while. The birth of the Aragalaya was not from the streets, but it was from social media, if you all would agree with me there. Absolutely. Because it was there that, uh, speaking, not to say that you all are not young, but uh, fairly towards the early 20s, myself here. <laughs> so, uh, most of, uh, even back then, most of my colleagues there uh, were very uh, adamant, my colleagues who uh, were friends and family who saw this, the Aragale, etc., uh, joined there in, uh, on social media and started this movement. So, Ambika, a small question to you actually. If uh, anyone watching this uh, fairly, anyone watching this on social media, right on their phones, they're watching this on their phones because they have the ability, the privilege right now to watch it. If they're watching it right now, what is something, what would directly affect them? What can they, because tomorrow maybe, uh, and maybe we all know that this bill is being brought in to avoid another Aragale, which was born from social media. And as a result of that, these, uh, we feel this pressure now because the bill is to be tabled on Tuesday. Now, a person watching this on social media or TV right now, how do they know what will affect them? What to say and what not to say after next Question. Tuesday, what will affect them? Can they say next I Tuesday? Don't like next this Tuesday won't be the benchmark because it's yes, only going to go to the. I mean, they table uh, it, and after they table yeah, yeah. it, you get you two weeks to uh, yeah. file. So we will be filing. As uh, I use <laughs> that as a metaphor, uh, there will be a day uh, that will come mm. in the coming few weeks. Mm -hmm. After a certain day, so what we're telling to the normal uh, yeah. general audience mm -hmm. is that a day will come in the next few weeks. After that, they can't post any of their free comments on social media, their long Facebook post runs have to stop. No, but the problem is... Uh, uh, no, but that's the purpose. Media. You're correct about that. That is the purpose though. The purpose is to make everyone afraid, to make everyone doubt. Second. And therefore then we will be like, but if it's, you know, the president, the prime minister, the minister, oh my God, we can't say. That is the very purpose. And we have seen how laws that are meant to protect our rights, like the ICCPR Act, right? have been used to abuse and violate our rights. So clearly, it won't be very easy, uh, difficult to manipulate the sections here, which you have seen are very, you know, they're overbroad, they're vague, there is no objective criteria, no legal definition. If they can manipulate that, that is the fear, because even when laws are drafted well, and they're supposed to protect our rights, our governments have shown us they are very adept at abusing them. So when you have such a bad law, that even like we can see that it violates so many rights. What do you think our government is going to do? Sandra, if I, if I have to answer your question, I would ask them to go to Singapore. Because when they go to Singapore, they will see that the technocrats are prayed. They do a good job. Corruption is zero. Okay. They're a developed nation. And hence, 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 they don't have to use the internet to do this oh, stuff. No, oh, no. Right? But my question, what I'm saying is, here is a country no. where we are bankrupt. Number two, there is absolute corruption. Public health is not being given properly. So that's the very reason why, you know, you have to comment. Right, so but you can't comment. Yeah. I so know people are getting nailed under the POFMA, don't you read? People are getting POFMA. We don't want POFMA, to use Singapore notices, as an POFMA example. POFMA warnings. POFMA. They're getting nailed on POFMA. Civic so activists. Why do you think Singapore is freedom such a wonderful yeah. place for expression? Yeah, freedom POFMA of expression is... is yeah. and this is an adaptation of POFMA. Adaptation of, uh, uh, so, some of the, some yeah, of the some clauses. Of the, some of the clauses are just uh, copy and paste. Yeah. See, the, the terminology of bots. Now, I thought this was fairly broad brushed. So, I just happened to uh, Google this. And it's the same thing as the Singapore. Yeah. Yeah, and, Singapore and the problem uh, is, dot, right. it, Chat GPT could essentially be, you know, defined uh -huh. as a bot. How are we going to do that? Right. So, uh, uh, Professor, uh, the, the, pro the point is, there are many stakeholders uh, in Sri Lanka when it comes to matters of this sort. The Information Communication Technology Agency, one. Uh, then you have the, uh, the Cyber Security, um, National Center for Cyber Security, CERT. 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 Uh, then you have SLASCOM, uh, as Dr. Rohanta mentioned. What are these stakeholders doing about uh, such, uh, such a billing question? Well, look, the question is, now I think the question of the Personal Data Protection Act was brought up. You see, our, our law, legislative process is broken in this country because even in the Westminster system, we had white paper procedure. Mm -hmm. And since 1982, and people rioted on the basis of the education white paper, nobody in this country puts out white papers. When I was at the ICTA, my minister was kind enough 
he said if you guys want to have consultations go ahead so we had consultations for the pdpa for the personal data protection yeah, act absolutely. we went and asked the people from the the sector we mm. put notices in the newspapers we put notices online and there were eight rounds of comments That's and that wasn't all i mean we have documented how our comments were responded to. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you yeah. one example, because actually that's a brilliant point of when it does work. Yeah. When the PDPA first came out, I believe uh, there was an initial draft somewhere. It had the registration requirement. Uh, no, not really. Actually, it more than that, sec uh, it had a section 26 where it said that all the operators within the country needed to be in local data centers. Oh, now, yes. the, now, because I was part of Slascom and we made the point, we said, listen, what, what about Uber? What about the e-commerce sector? Mm -hmm. What about all these guys who are in, you know, the what data What about centers? the frequent flyer program? Exactly. So then, you know, they actually took that. Well, comment. they took it out right at the end. Right I at was the end. in the middle of that fight. I know, but actually. They took it out right at the end. But we made. But, but even now, just to give you an example, the provisions regarding government data are still restricted. Exactly. And that is one reason why we have government data disappearing. Because we don't have the ability the QR code <laughs> database was on Amazon, on AWS. AWS. Because Against it was the, private the, the thing was not, and, and, and because the act wasn't in force. But if the act was in force, you. we would not have had an efficient QR code system. Because this says you have to rely only on two data centers in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. right? For the public yeah. sector. Yeah. So there are, yeah. there are various problems that we couldn't all resolve, but, but at least the private sector we saved. But actually, what the point I was trying to make is, we had time to give our comments. We had eight well, rounds of consultations. That took five years. Exactly. From eight, from we, we did the consultations. Eight consultations eight in consult 2019. Absolutely. So right. the point is this, and and the and what came out was a law that listen, there may be gaps, but at least it's acceptable. Right, so, 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 so we have we have some questions coming in from our viewers. Uh, for Professor Samarjeeva, recently EU introduced new laws against AI technology. Many people in Sri Lanka are also facing issues related to AI technology. So, in my opinion, is such a bill uh, helpful to cover some AI crimes? What, your, what do no, you think about No, when we talk AI, you see AI is one of these buzzwords, right? Mm -hmm. So, narrow AI, machine learning, we've been doing it for a long time. Even the PDPA has got a provision about the use of automated decision making, right? Section 18. Which I think is quite problematic, but it's there. So, we already have some provisions in enacted law. Now we are talking about general uh, AI. Uh, actually, that's not the subject of today's conversation. Uh, I believe uh, we should have a broad uh, ranging conversation among stakeholders about what the pros and cons are. Right? A, a national policy on yeah. AI. Yeah, actually my first op-ed on this subject was back in 2018. So, but the uh, president I've been on that. The president hey. did say he's willing to invest some so millions in AI earlier this year. Well, we are not talking about investments, so we are talking about a legal frame. Yeah. That's a, a separate question. Well. So, we are here talking about restrictions on expression, right? That's what we are talking about, exactly. on expression. That's the heart of our di discussion today, right? On a fundamental right guaranteed to us by the, by the, the Constitution under Section 14, Article 14.1a, we have a guaranteed right. Now, remember, why all this religious mumbo-jumbo language is there, right? Why it's hidden here is because 1401A is, is made conditional under 152, which hmm. says restrictions as may be prescribed by law in the age of racial and religious it's harmony. Hmm. That is why all this religious language has been inserted here. Hmm. In order to get through so, you put the religious language in, but you're actually trying to hide this thing about public health and public order and, and mm -hmm. so on, right? That's the intention of this. This is not done by uh, incompetent people. I'd say there are some devious uh, drafters have been working on this, right? Including, for example, Section 17, I think is there. It's a complete red herring. Mm -hmm. the, the route where you don't go to the commission and you go directly to the magistrate is there as a red herring. That is to take attention away. They'll say the, the, the uh, uh, additional solicitor general will get up and say, oh, we, we, we are not disempowering the courts. We are allowing the judiciary to make a decision, etc., etc. But 
the point is focus on six, 16 which is the easier route mm -hmm. which goes every human being will take the easier route rather than the more difficult route and because i've talked route. to these people right i've talked to these people people who are grieved who have, who's who for whom hurt has been caused by online material mm. right? right they are upset and they don't they they don't have all these fundamental rights concerns they want somebody to take that that thing that is annoying them off the internet that's what they want mm. right uh, Amika, now, a few days back, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka uh, quite unreservedly asked for the withdrawal of this bill and another bill, uh, the anti-terrorism uh, bill. Uh, but what happened today? The ministers uh, involved went ahead and tabled them anyway. They will be like tabled on the order paper of parliament. Yes, on the order paper. So it, it appears that they're not even willing to uh, take the advice uh, uh, of the, uh, the Bar Association? Uh, well, I think uh, going back to the, you know, the whole legislative process, uh, in Sri Lanka uh, it is uh, very close, there is no transparency and um, we have seen even for instance, um, you know, uh, rumour has it uh, about different laws, you hear stories, right, of who drafted it and why and you find out the stories often go back to one individual uh, for one purpose and they seem to have the year of the particular minister and they managed to get this amendment uh, you know actually gazetted so and there's no consultation with the stakeholders now let's take for instance even the proposed truth and reconciliation uh, no truth commission they call it or whatever it is but the truth commission four different statements were issued by four different groups from the north and the east right government completely disregarded them has had no consultation with them and it seems that they are going full steam ahead so that as i said shows contempt for our citizens they are also disrespecting the process of drafting the law mm. right yeah. they're disrespecting everything because it is about consolidating their own power and they're weaponizing what i've been saying repeatedly they're weaponizing the law they do not white ban us anymore Instead, they use the ICCPR Act, the uh, digital, what is it, the Online Safety Act, the Anti-Terrorism Law, the ICCPR Act, the Penal Code, the PTA. That is what they're doing. This That's is all part of that. Right. So, uh, I just want to give um, each panelist an opportunity to wrap up uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, the, uh, the bill in question that is under discussion. So, let's start off with Rohanda. What are your thoughts and what's the way forward? I think the time has come because IMF has also given uh, a, a, a view that they are not very happy with what's happening. So I think the government must take heed of the reality and forget being introvert as to how you're going to protect your seat and ask oh, what can I do for the country and do what's going to drive the economy in the current context, Shamil. It's very clear. I mean, if you're, if you're going to bring in control mechanisms rather than seeing as to how you can drive the brand, I mean, what, what logic do you have? Mm -hmm. So, my concluding thoughts are very simple. It's starting from top down, have mm -hmm. to ask themselves, what have I done in the last year, right? What, what, where am I going right now? And, and why is it that I'm stopping people talk? Am, am I doing so much wrong that I want people to stop talking? I mean, normally in the world, when countries are coming out of a financial crisis, they want the people to talk. It's the people are the strongest brand to the world. And, and that's how we build nation brands. But here, we, we are doing the reverse. So I think they must look at some best practices around the world, not only in IT and online, but how you build economies. Right. Um, and now my attention towards Asela um, Vaidyal, Ankara cyber security expert. What are your thoughts? Uh, um, I go back to in where conclusion. I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you go back uh, to uh, You say now there is no good, but the, the bad and the ugly is more. I change your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I still maintain that there was a problem this was going to solve. Mm -hmm. um, if they really want to solve it, they'll have to probably take this out and start a very long consultation process with the relevant stakeholders. That is civil society, uh, that is the internet service providers, that is digital marketing professionals. So many parties and stakeholders that have been identified. Listen to their opinions because this is been gazetted on the 18th of September. Today is the 27th, it's been placed on the order paper. Where is the consultation? And I spoke about the Personal Data Protection Act 
uh, professor said it was a four year consultation with the industry a back and forth and and we settled on something but it was a four year back and forth uh, shami even the online uh, bill uh, in uk that was a four year consultation there were points of mm -hmm. of contention there there still is but laws take time laws yeah. take time and especially something of this nature you if you want to take a policy stance on this good no problem let's talk but certainly not on this way certainly with not as ambika said sir, of these insidious elements here we can't go forward with this start a consultation talk to the industry make a white paper on it and then we'll form something that is acceptable and consolidate that view as a law well, thank you very much uh, asala vaidya lankara i now move my attention towards ambika satkarnathan former commissioner of the human rights commission of sri lanka well this is colin uh, what is it into um, yeah there you go yes online safety act right but bill act it will become an act but i think what it the safety is for the state it is for the government what it will do to us all of us citizens it will make us more unsafe and uh, you know create insecurity for us uh, as i said we should instead call it the internet censorship bill uh, and look at this not just as one law but as part of this you know building block that the government is trying to construct by using different laws to undermine our civic rights and civic rights are important uh, even if you want to have a thriving economy you cannot have it when people's rights are being violated when there is disaffection when their social cohesion is undermined you do need social cohesion to have a thriving economy right and uh, therefore i think which is why and i'm glad to see that different sectors care about this not just the you know civil society who are usually out there screaming about this i'm very glad to see and i hope as our sailors said that even the it industry would come out with a statement and understand how even business economy all will be affected when the government's intent is to expand its power and to consolidate authoritarian uh thank you very much ambika for your thoughts uh, dr uh, professor rohan samarjeeva chair of learn asia i think the internet poses some novel challenges i think people are actually harmed by content that is posted on the internet on various platforms by their articulation by them going viral by doxing by various kinds of novel phenomena that our earlier remedies don't cover this law is not the solution i don't think a law is a solution absolutely i think that yeah. collaborating cooperating with industry mm -hmm. having feedback having absolutely. consultations mm -hmm. and that has already been done actually in this country we have an industry code we just have one or two companies to sign in or not with this threat i'm hoping they will they will agree to sign up we can get that industry code done right now and you don't have to as government you don't have to give up on on legislating but uh, there's a document that i worked on where we say you know treat it not not just rely on 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 consultations but treat it as what we call a regulatory sandbox see how it works yeah. they will have to give data they will have to give reports on how many complaints came in how many takedowns were done how quickly they were done uh, how effective were the mechanisms under the code look at that and then go to a core regulatory model where you still rely on a code to do the job but in the extreme cases where that isn't enough and you got to throw somebody into jail then the state has to come in so there is there are precedents for that we have solutions this is not the solution and i i am confident that this will not make it through uh, the supreme court uh, because this is against our constitution as well thank you very much uh, professor rohan samarjeeva chair of learn asia asil vaidya lankar cyber security expert ambika satyanathan former commissioner of the human rights commission of sri lanka as well as dr rohan dattu korala country head of uh, crew track software labs sri lanka maldives and pakistan thank you very much nivesh Thank you very much, Sandra, for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. I leave you tonight with a quote, as I always do. If we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. Take care and good night.